Hello and welcome to The Asian Game. I'm your host, Scott McIntyre in Japan. And on today's show, we continue the build-up to the AFC Asian Cup with a look at Group B, featuring Australia, Uzbekistan, Syria and India. Joining me as they always are are my regular co-hosts, Michael Church in Hong Kong and Paul Williams in Adelaide. And we're delighted to say we have a special guest with us today, former Socceroo, and now also someone with a strong connection to India. It's uh, the one and only Eric Partaloo. Eric, thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Pleasure. Great to be here and great to see your faces. I'm not sure if we're in the right cities there, but uh, yeah, somewhere in the background, you look all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the blur gives it away, I think. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the group chat in a minute, but just, just briefly, your, your journey, you've hung up the boots now and you've moved into a different um, kind of career. Can, can you just fill in the listeners? Yeah, what, what's been going on the last um, five to 10 years in, in uh, the land of Eric Cardaloo? Yeah, wow. Uh, long time. Um, yeah, I, I finished playing about three years ago or two and a half years ago. Uh, and I spent f- the last four years of my playing career playing in India. And I probably had a good year or two left in me and um, was kind of forced out as as most people are in Asian clubs and um, had quite a good relationship with Bengaluru actually. And it didn't, didn't end the way that we all wanted it to. Um, and then COVID sort of happened and I made the decision that, um, you know, rather than try and push on and look for another club and cause I'd, I'd gone to, you know, seven or eight different countries in my career and I'd gone through that process. I was quite tired of the, the moving around and, um, you know, it sort of took a big, a big chunk out of my life as well. So, um, and the TV came knocking and I couldn't say no to, to giving it a go. And honestly, I thought I was going to go back into playing football a couple of months later. And um, because of COVID, I didn't really get the chance to travel too much or try again. And I just sort of fell into it and really enjoyed uh, the commentary side and the, the punditry side of the ISL at the start. And it's been, you know, it's my third season doing it now and over across there in India. And the commentary part of it for me is where I've really taken it to the next level and for anybody that finishes uh, playing football, you know, if you talk to them, you're just lucky to stay involved in the game in some capacity. So for me, you know, coaching wasn't an option straight away. It might be in the future, but for now, it's it's a career in in TV. You you were I'm, obviously you know our paths crossed during your playing career as well. You always struck me as you know a, a well spoken kind of play, which isn't always the way. Um, was that something that you you always had kind of designs on getting into the TV side of things? Oh, you, you know, when you're playing, Scotty, you're so um, you're so blinded. You have, your, you have your blinkers on when you play all the time, and everyone tells you to start preparing for the next thing. And you know, sometimes as a footballer, you say, "If I start thinking about other things, and I'm not going to give 100 percent into my career." And that's exactly how I felt. And we're very lucky in Australia; we have the options and the opportunity of having media training if you go to a high level and play. And um, I never really wanted to sound robotic when I gave interviews when I look back on it now I was pretty much a straight bat character and and when you go on TV now you've really got to have or try and have some sort of personality and make it exciting for TV but uh it's always something I felt comfortable with and I find it quite therapeutic to talk about football because um giving away the game is just so difficult you know I've come out of this this hangover if you like the last two or three years and you go through a lot of challenges on and off the off the pitch when you finish and um, you don't really want to give it away. You're not sure if you should give it away and you always feel like you can still play all the time. And um, just being able to talk about football and being involved, uh, I've come to the, the, the point now where I've the ego has completely left me and um, I know I can't play anymore and I'm very happy to be in the next chapter of my life. All right. Well, yeah, not, not only do you need personality, you need a, an opinion. And so that's why we got you here and, and we're going to get, we're going to get some. Let, let, let's dive um, straight into it, starting with the Socceroos. Um, but I think for many people uh, going into the tournament as one of the favourites, certainly there's been a bit of discussion down the years, you know, should, uh, you know, it's, it's as you know, it's not the way um, in a lot of Asian nations to come out publicly and declare that you're going to win tournaments and, and that you can see yourselves the favourites. We've seen Australia do that in the past. We've seen a bit of it in this tournament as well. So they've kind of laid it out there that they're, they're going out there expecting to win. Do you um, do you rightly see them as as one of the say two or three kind of major contenders to to, to be standing there lifting the trophy in in uh, that second week of February? Oh, it's, a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because you want to have the team full of confidence, 
and you want to have the team really lifting themselves after a really strong World Cup campaign. Who would have thought we would have got through that group and come out and, and had such a great performance, even against France the first game, and, and losing, losing out to eventual winners Argentina. If you don't build on that, and um, I think when you play football in Asia, it's not like playing in South America where everyone's out there to, to try and you know cheat and fight and scratch their way through. But um, when you're the big boys in Asia, I think winning the, the tournament in 2015 gives us the license to, to think that way. Coming out publicly is another thing, um, and particularly if it's coming from players that possibly, um, I don't know, not necessarily haven't proved themselves on that stage, but I, I wouldn't have expected that from an Australian, um, you know, camp to come out and say, you know, we're here to win it type of thing. I, I love seeing it, I love hearing it, um, but can we back it up? And certainly, when you look at that that group, I don't think we're not. I don't think we're not going to get through. We're, we're going to get through the group, and it's about who do we meet in that first round of sixteen quarterfinal, semi final. But there's some good teams there. Japan and South Korea have taken really heavy, heavy sides. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, even can, can even you know those sorts of ties can really pose a problem. So. Australia last year, or the last Asian Cup, where they got knocked out by by the UAE. Um, so it's it's a difficult one to ask. I love the enthusiasm. I love the the, the attitude. Um, and we're going to have to wait and see how they perform in the group stage. If they can get themselves on a roll and win all three, then they've got to they've got to talk the talk and walk the walk. It's a it is a it's a different challenge playing at this Asian Cup as all, compared to playing at the World Cup because. In some ways, the World Cup was an easy it was was easier if I can put it like that. It's never easy to play at a World Cup, but the expectations were so low given the the qualifying campaign that we had had. You know, Graham Arnold almost got the sack. We had to go through the playoffs. The expectation was incredibly low going in, and Australia and Australian sides love being that underdog with their backs against the wall. That's often when we perform our best coming into this Asian cup, as you said, we're talking about going in as one of the favorites where we are expected to take the game to the opposition rather than play on the counter attack. So it, from a, a football tactical point of view, it's a completely different challenge. This for Graham Arnold and the side, isn't it? Yeah. Has that ever worked in the history of sport where a team's come out and said, we're going to win it or we're going to try and win it. We're here to win it. Everybody's there to win it. Um, I, I just think with the environment that the Graham Arnold has always produced with his sides, um, there's something special. They really want to play for each other. Ca- going into camp isn't about just training and and you know looking forward to the games. Um, I really tip my hat off to him in terms of the games that were chosen for 2023. Some massive games in there that a lot of teams, a lot of coaches would have said, "Whoop." We need to watch our ranking here. I need to watch my job here. Ecuador twice, England, Mexico, um, Argentina again, like games where you're not expected to win. Now, if I flip that around to the likes of India and the games that they've chosen over the calendar year, that they've chosen teams that are below them in the rankings or amongst them. So uh, in terms of them, um, the way that they've got to go out and play, yeah, we want to see a different side that was at the World Cup because some of those games, yeah, we tried to express ourselves and open up. We got those two one nil results. We're going to have to come out and, and, and beat teams by multiple goals here. So what he's done with the squad, and we can talk about that later, is that I think he's got the right ingredients there to, to cause problems from all angles of the pitch. Let, let, let's get on to the squad then. Um... A, f- a few surprise names um, that were included. I, I guess maybe a, a, a couple of exclusions as well, but certainly, yeah, some eye raising um, kind of guys that you know hadn't been involved at all uh, in in the setup that that did come in. And and you know, it's always a case where we compare it back to say um, you know two or three World Cup cycles ago, and uh, and the squads were stacked with players doing well and playing regularly at big European leagues. It's not that kind of a squad uh, anymore, and we've uh, we've kind of come. You know, come to be adjusted with that. Is there the? Is there the? I mean, particularly if, okay. You set it up against the likes of Japan, uh, Korea, who you mentioned before, even even Saudis, who who have you know the kind of game 
changing game breaking players that can make the difference at the pointy end of the tournament. Do we have those players uh, in, in this squad? And yeah, just just your general thoughts and uh, on, on the makeup of it. Yeah, I mean, guys like Yangi for me, they're, they're, they're the future of the game where you've got uh, guys playing in the UK that are, um, you know, powerful, got goals in them. Um, I'm, I'm very surprised, I have to say, that, that Jamie McLaren's not in the squad. And, you know, we, we haven't got to the bottom of how that's occurred in terms of is it, is it one of those where Arnie wasn't going to play him from the start or did he simply not pick him? Taking a 36-year-old, Bruno Fornaroli, um, who's in the form of his life, I love that gamble. So on the flip side, I love the gamble that he said, well, right here, right now, Bruno's not going to get me to the next World Cup possibly, but you're going to step in now and, and score me goals. Mitchell Duke, you know, he scored a World Cup goal. He's in the team. Craig Goodwin's playing in Asia with Saudi. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be excited about in terms of the firepower. Um, I just... I worry where Jamie McLaren sits with the future because in terms of Aussie goal scorers, is there a better option for us at number nine? We're talking the next four or five years. Um, I don't I don't really see that. Just and just on the back of that too, talking about the the squad, I think what Australia has so often lacked is that real creative spark in midfield. Um, you know. The, the tactical Illuminati of Australian football often bemoan sort of our, our U-shaped possession. And that's often because we've lacked that creative outlet in midfield. We've had Rogic before, um, a little bit of Aaron Moy in there as well. You know, we're, we're, we're blessed with wingers and, and players with speed who can whip the ball in like Goodwin, like Boyle. We've got tireless workers like Duke. Um, McLaren's a little bit like that, but as you said, not in this squad. It looked like Aiden Hrustic was was going to be that player, but he's sort of now gone into obscurity over the last 12 months. And when I look at this squad, I see plenty of talented players, but I don't necessarily see that creativity that we're going to need, particularly as you get deeper into the tournament against the best sides. If you're going to come up against a Japan or a Korea who do have those players, I just don't see that in in this squad. Riley McGree perhaps can play that. I mean, he's got his own fitness concerns as well. Sammy Silvera, he's better out wide. Marco Tilio's better out wide as well. So for me, I just have a concern about where the creativity is going to come from. And we've seen that with Australia. We saw it in the last World Cup cycle as well. When we have to take the game to oppositions and they're sitting deep, do we have the creativity within the squad to be able to play through that deep block um, and I'm just not sure if we've got that creativity in this side as well. Yeah, it's a great pickup. I, I, I like the idea of Australia playing with a, with a playmaker all the time. Um, to be creative, you don't necessarily need to go through that central position. It can always be, you know, if you're playing a 3-5-2 or a 3-4-3 and, and allow guys to get wide and overlap and outnumber in the wide areas. I like the, 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 the youth... It, it, you know, the young players in this squad, like, you know, Geordie Boss, haven't seen so much of him as his Bayage would be expected to start. But you want to see in the future, you've got energy up and down the wings. And if you saw that game against Bangladesh, they, they weren't really an opponent we can we can analyse and look towards. But the, the beauty about this game against Bahrain and and also with India coming up is is that we might get past them in the first half. But it's really in that second half of the game where we're going to tire teams out by going side to side, keeping possession, as you said, and then we've got to try and penetrate. And I think in the second half of this game tomorrow night, um, even though it's a friendly, we'd really need to try and you know find a way through um, through lines. And who's that player? Is it Connor Metcalf trying to play those passes? Will Tilio get minutes from the start? Will Martin Boyle come in there and start razzling because he hasn't been playing that regularly for the national team? He missed the World Cup, didn't he? Um, there's got to be a hunger from the squad to to try and create, but you can be creative from from all areas of the pitch, all, all areas of the pitch. Just before then, we we move off off, off the squad. A, a couple of young players um, that have got a lot of attention. Um, Alex Robertson is one who now people are suggesting uh, we may be at risk of losing to Peru. I'm not sure uh, the the ins and outs of the regulations around that, but um, you know he's one that 
that got a look in some of these squads recently and, and obviously has been doing well at his club. And then Nessori and Kunda is the other one as well. Were, were they, um, were they, you, you mentioned you were surprised about McLaren. Were perhaps some of those youngsters, particularly if there is this concern about losing Robertson to Peru, were they the ones that maybe you were surprised about or anyone else that wasn't in the squad? Particularly, you know, we've seen what Iran Kunda can do in the A-League and we talk about these game changes. Even with the age, he's surely the profile of someone who could come on and, and make that kind of difference. Yeah, I'm surprised. But maybe it's just a maturity thing at uh, at international level and maybe not want to cast him in too early. But you, you run the risk of losing these types of players. I'm surprised that we're looking at guys like Gethin Jones, you know, so, so, so late on in their career. And he's a guy that was in, in Wales, I believe. Um, and was it was it Gethin Jones was the Welsh guy, right? And you know he he captained the Welsh side all the way from 16s to 21s, and you know he's come out publicly saying that he felt more Welsh than Australian. That's fine. Um, I think this what separates us from, particularly from my point of view, India don't allow anyone else to play unless you you're born in India. So they're trying to reverse this rule now as we speak. Um, but for Australia, look at the, the diversity. Seven of these players in the squad are not born in Australia. A couple are from Scotland, South Africa, Kenya. Um, you know, the, the, the squad there, and that gives you different attributes. I think Iran Kunda from, from Adelaide, for me, would have been so exciting throwing him on the last 5, 10, 15 minutes of games and just saying, give us something. We don't have a player like that in Australia. We haven't produced players like that. So... Um, but maybe there's some sort of protection element there, you know, from, from Arnold. Uh, I think that's more, more his, his protection is probably thinking about the next cycle, the World Cup qualifiers, let him go across to Europe and maybe it's too early for him.